following interview was conducted with Joseph L. Bennett, uh, Vice President for University Relations for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, April 1, 2008, Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about your early years and parents and education. Uh, well, I grew up in, I was born in uh, Pennsylvania. I grew up in a very small town called Lewis Run, Pennsylvania. Uh, it had about uh, maybe six or seven hundred people live there. Uh, most people in the town were of Italian ancestry, as uh, three of my grandparents uh, were, were Italian, uh, uh, two of them immigrated from Italy. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a, that kind of a culture. Uh, it was a town that's uh, in the mountainous region in the, the northern part of the state, and uh, not a lot of industry there, but there was a small brick plant, and my grandfather, after he immigrated, had come there and, and worked in that plant uh, for many years, uh, making brick because of, there was a particular type of clay that was available in, that, uh, in the ground there. And, uh, uh, and then there was a small industrial city called Bradford, Pennsylvania, about six miles away, and that was uh, where you got most of your resources. Bradford uh, at the time had a number of uh, 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 thriving factories. Uh, the uh, Zippo Manufacturing was there and still is. Uh, Kendall Oil was there, uh, it just still has a presence, but it doesn't, uh, it's not as thriving as it used to be. Uh, Case Knives are made there. and. Uh, the biggest company was uh, the place where my father worked. It was called uh, Dresser Manufacturing, and it was part of the uh, Dresser Halliburton Corporation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, when I was born in 1942, uh, uh, things were thriving there. Uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, wartime uh, manufacturing that went on, and uh, a lot of the places were converted to that. Uh, but it's not an area that's uh, uh, very agriculturally suited. It's, it's quite cold climate. Um, and it's not good soil, so uh, if it's either uh, initially forestry and oil were the things that made it prosperous, uh, later more manufacturing things, uh, but it was that kind of a community. Uh, I went to a school <coughs> in which we had eight grades uh, in three rooms. So we had there were three, three classrooms and three teachers, uh, and uh, a lot of people might see that as a disadvantage educationally, but. I really don't think it was. I felt like I got a pretty good education. Uh, the, the teachers uh, were, uh, there were various ones through the years, but they were all pretty remarkable women. And uh, uh, for example, uh, when I was in fourth grade, it was fourth grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade all in the same room, and she would teach, uh, she'd teach one class and give the other ones assignments to read or do, do work on and then uh, you know, go to the next one and had to maintain order in that situation. There probably would be about 30 students in the room. Uh, and, uh, but I actually, over the years, uh, by the time I got to the sixth grade, I'd heard all the sixth grade uh, lessons. Uh, and uh, I, I, I just, just absorbed, a, I may be a slow learner, but I absorbed a lot that way. Uh, and I felt like I really, uh, as I look back on it, it was a good, it was a good experience for me. Then I went to a, a small Catholic high school in Bradford. We. Uh, we were bused to school uh, in the mornings and the evenings, but if you had any ex extracurricular activities, in my case, uh, I'd play football and I did some other things. Uh, if you didn't get on the bus on the way home, you pretty much had to hitchhike, and that's that's the way you traveled. Sure. In those days, you could do that. So, yeah. uh, how large was the high school? Uh, there were uh, probably was it co -ed, boys and girls. It was boys. It was boys and girls uh, taught by the Sisters of St. Joseph's. Mm -hmm. uh, Sisters of St. Joseph, very. Uh, uh, very dedicated women, uh, and uh, one of them really had a strong influence on me. Uh, <clears throat> when I grad, she was my English teacher, Sister Kathleen. Uh, I will always be grateful to her. She, uh, I don't know what she saw in me, but she saw something because she wouldn't leave me alone. Uh, and uh, when I first uh, graduated uh, from high school, uh, I decided to go to Penn State uh, and went to the Penn State at a campus in Erie. Pennsylvania, and it was much more uh, economical to go there. Uh, but she did not like the idea of my not going to a Catholic college. So uh, uh, sometime during my freshman, the first semester of my freshman year, she called me up, I think it was over Thanksgiving vacation, and she said, uh, I want you to go down to Pittsburgh and uh, 
visit Duquesne University. I've arranged for financial aid for you there. Uh, I've arranged for you to be admitted to their uh, journalism program. And uh, uh, wow. she wow. did this, so I... Uh, I, I honestly <laughs> didn't know what else to do. Uh, I, I was used to doing what the what the sisters told me to do, so sure. I went to Pittsburgh and I talked to the people there, and I ended up going to Duquesne. And I had uh, some scholarships and some and some loans, and uh, so I, that was where I graduated and got my bachelor's degree. Tell us a little about what campus life. Did you live on campus, and what sort of activities did you get involved in? Uh, du <laughs> Duquesne was a uh, uh, was at a, a very urban campus. It's located uh, almost in downtown Pittsburgh, uh, and actually most of its students uh, were commuter students. They commuted from different parts of Pittsburgh. It was established as a college to serve the uh, sort of uh, the children of the working class, a lot of in much in the same way that a school like Purdue was uh, established for that purpose. But it was a little different idea. Uh, so most of the students lived at home and uh, drove into campus, but there was a small uh, on-campus community. Uh, at that time, uh, they had a they had a sort of a conventional women's dormitory with the uh, uh, where, where the ladies could live. Uh, the men's dormitories, uh, rather than have a single residence, they had they had converted about oh maybe fifteen uh, uh, old homes, that, each of which could house about twenty. Mm -hmm. uh, of the male students, students. and uh, so you live you you know you lived in these uh, kind of uh, they were probably were fire traps but they were they were official dormitories uh, and uh, I remember I lived in St. Thomas uh, Hall and uh, each of them would have a, uh, a graduate student or a law student or perhaps as a proctor who, who was a live-in person kind of an RA uh, and uh, but we had they had no uh, facilities on campus for feeding students at all so you were you were kind of on your own did they have cook could you cook in the houses too could not cook it oh, was just it was strictly a strictly a bedroom hmm. uh, and so uh, so you had to go out for your meals and stuff huh you had to go you go out you had to figure it out you were just on your own and yeah so you could and there were some restaurants that served students and you could buy a meal plan and, and there were cafeterias on campus uh, sure but they were like the ones that Purdue has in the Union, in that you, sure. you didn't have a, uh, it was not a, they were not set up to to serve regular meals on a, and have you pay for it on a semester basis or anything like that. Yeah. So uh, it's an interesting. Did you were you in any clubs when you were uh, there? Uh, oh, I was in uh, I was in a variety of uh, of clubs. I, I, I joined a fraternity, uh, Phi Kappa Theta, which there's a chapter at Purdue. Uh, and you were very active in that. We did. Uh, they did a lot of music and theater kinds of things, uh, in addition to the usual social things that you do, and they kept you busy. I was a. Uh, uh, I was a member of the staff member of the, uh, of the newspaper, which is called the Duquesne Duke, and uh, it was a weekly paper. Uh, and I wrote. Uh, I did writing and and some copy editing and things like that, and. Uh, uh, so was, I was able to develop, I think, uh, some skills in, in that capacity. Sure. But uh, uh, I, I, my interests w were: I, I liked to write, and I liked. Uh, I was interested in, uh, in not so much in politics, but in political science. I, I, so I had a journalism major and a minor in political science. That was a good combination. So yeah, yeah and that, it was you know it seemed like it made sense to me at the time. And although I never really got into uh, political coverage. I really was fascinated. I love to read uh, uh, court cases and things like that. Sure. I enjoyed that very much. What year did you graduate from? I graduated from Duquesne in uh, 1965. Okay. Uh, and I, uh, at that time, the Vietnam War was on. I expected uh, after I graduated that uh, there would be a high likelihood that I'd be drafted, and I didn't really want to avoid the draft, but I kind of wanted to do it on my own terms, and so I, uh, I applied for and was accepted to uh, Naval Officer Candidate School. And I went to Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, they, you spent about uh, 19 weeks there, uh, and they made you from a civilian into a into a naval officer. Uh, so I, I got a, I received a commission, and uh, I spent most of my naval career aboard a ship, the USS Monrovia. Uh, it sailed out of New, uh, out of New, Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, I remember going on the ship. Uh, uh, this was right before I was married, and I was uh, I was hoping that uh, I'd have some time to spend with my uh, with my fiance. 
uh, and I got on the ship on a Friday, and I learned that it was leaving on a six-month cruise the following Monday. Uh, and we did. Uh, I spent most of that time at sea. You were, you, 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 we were in port uh, some 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 of that time, but uh, there were uh, there were two six-month cruises to the Mediterranean, and a six-month period when we were in the uh, shipyards being uh, overhauled in New York City, uh, Brooklyn actually. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I got married. Uh, I entered the Navy in uh, uh, the winter of '65. We got married in 1966, probably, and got out of the Navy in '68. Probably did not, probably did not see my wife uh, a third of that time. Wow. The first few years of our marriage. How about that? So, but you know, you uh, I know, you, right? You, you do those things, and you. Uh, you get or along. move on. Yeah, you move on, and right. uh, it was, and, uh, and my wife was uh, was also at Duquesne. Uh, I met her there. Uh, she was a uh, uh, she enrolled in the Navy nurse program and got her commission. Uh, and she was kind of about a year behind me, but she only had to serve two years, where I served three, and uh, so we got out within a few months of each other. And the Navy was very good in those days, and I imagine they still are about uh, at least letting you be in the same. Sure. be in the same general locality and we obviously couldn't be served directly together or anything like that and you know, I had to do my all my duties and she had to do hers sure. but it was a great experience for her too she uh, when she uh, uh, started at the Portsmouth Naval Hospital uh, she'd been there a short time and uh, the the woman who was her commanding officer called her in and said uh, how would you like to be in the, how would you like to work in intensive care? And Adele said, I, uh, I don't think I'm ready for anything like that. I don't have very much experience, and that seems like a lot of, uh, quite a, more of a challenge than I'm ready for. And she said, uh, this was before, this was actually before we'd, we'd gotten married, and she, she said, uh, Miss Haynes, uh, th this, that was not a, this is not a request. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me put it another way, let me, right? Let me put it another way. Right. So she became an intensive care nurse and, and later a cardiac intensive care nurse in the Navy. She got really, really good experience oh, in that bet. because oh, yeah. that's really served her very well. And she continues to be a, uh, to work uh, work as a nurse, and she it's just kind of work that she loves. So sure. uh, got out of the Navy in uh, 1968 in July. My wife got out in September, and uh, we decided to... Uh, we really weren't quite sure where we wanted to uh, to get settled, but I thought I would look for something in the Midwest just because we had never lived there before. And so I uh, I answered an ad for a position at the Indianapolis News, uh, which is a daily afternoon newspaper, and uh, got the, I uh, I went out and uh, interviewed, and I, I was offered the job there. And so we moved to Indianapolis. Uh, spent about three years there working as an editor. Uh, I was uh, I, I sat. I worked on the copy desk. I did a little bit of writing, but mostly editing. And uh, I worked as the uh, the layout editor of the paper. So I would lay out the in, the pages of the newspaper. Sure. Uh, and uh, then I decided we decided we wanted to go back to Pittsburgh uh, in the early 70s. And uh, I I applied for a job at the uh, Pittsburgh Press, and was offered that position and went there as an editor and after several years I wanted to do more writing and I asked to be transferred to an opening in the uh, Sunday magazines and uh, so I worked on the Sunday magazines for about uh, I guess about uh, about six years mm -hmm. uh, writing feature stories and uh, again it was a good Those experience. Those are always a good supplement to the paper I think. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, we, at that time we published we published two magazines and, mm -hmm. uh, and it was nice you could write you could sort of pick your own topics and uh, write almost as much as you wanted to, mm -hmm. and uh, there was an opportunity to do, write some humor and uh, personal things like that, and I enjoyed that very much, and uh, it was uh, kind of gratifying for me. And uh, I, one day I got the kind of got the wanderlust, and I thought, I really feel like I've got to, if I'm going to live, do this kind of work you know, on newspapers, I'm going to always be in big cities, and I, being a small town person. Uh, growing, growing up that way, I was comfortable in the city, but I wanted to try uh, maybe a smaller community. And I really kind of thought 
a university community would be a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I saw a job opening at Penn State. They were looking for somebody to run their news operation. And uh, I went to University Park. I was hired by a man named Art Siervo, who's uh, been very influential in this uh, field, in the uni university public relations field. And I spent about three years there. And one day, out of the blue, I got a letter from Purdue, and it said they were looking for a director of public information and that I had been recommended. And uh, I never did know who recommended me, uh, but uh, probably somebody I met at a conference or something like that. And uh, I really didn't, was had no desire to leave, but the fact that I'd lived in Indiana and I still had friends here uh, led me to answer the letter. And I answered the letter and one thing led to another and uh, came to Purdue and uh, I interviewed with a number of people uh, who are, uh, some of whom are still around here, uh, but the who, was, who would have been the head then at that time? Was uh, it public at, relations? Uh, at that time, <laughs> uh, the position was director of public information, uh, but it was the structure was different then, and, and, uh, and he reported to the vice president for development, and that was John Day, who was a uh, who had been with the Cran a dean at Craner. John Day had been a professor, and then he was the dean of the of the Craner School, and then. Uh, he took the job as uh, vice president for development and had run the first campaign, I think that uh, first serious campaign that Purdue did, mm -hmm. did I believe it was called the Plan for the 80s. Right. Uh, it, was, it was launched in the early 70s, but I, I came to Purdue in 1981. Uh-huh. What so, was the, what would have been the uh, public, uh, director of public information, what did that entail? Uh, uh, at that time, uh, it was really, what it included was the, well, what is now the University News Service okay. and uh, Broadcast Services, uh, which at that time was uh, uh, just it, radio. WBA, uh, would that have been It was WBA? not WBAA, oh. no, we've never, there's never been a direct affiliation between WBAA and, uh, and my but, area. But if you sent items to the, new, to the radio, that would be out of there. We would, yeah, what we would do is uh, we would produce uh, uh, Ray Cubberly, who is the director of broadcast services now. Uh, he, had, he had been here uh, maybe a little bit less than a year before mm -hmm. me. And uh, Ray, uh, he would produce, we would produce uh, 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 radio programs for radio newscasts. So, uh, uh, and in those d radio has changed a lot in recent years, but in those days, uh, most stations had their own news, uh, would do their own newscasts every day. And uh, so the idea was you would find produced stories that would fit into those, and, uh, and we would... Uh, uh, Send the script and things for that, yeah. We, well, we, we, would actually, we would actually go out, Ray would go out and do, he would interview people, hmm. uh, and then put together a, a produced program, and we would send it on tape to the uh, uh, to the news directors at programs, and the idea would be they would just plug these into their sure. into their newscasts, and we did something very similar with television. Uh, you would produce. We would. Uh, uh, we did not have a uh, television production operation uh, in my office, but uh, the office that was then called the Center for Instructional Services had a, uh, a broadcast quality camera that was owned by a sort of a consortium that included included public information and a, and a couple of other areas and uh, we would we would produce uh, spots that uh, like a 90 second program that would be dropped into a television newscast and we would distribute these by mail putting them putting videotapes in the mail oh really good we did all our new and but we spent most of our time and most of our resources uh, on print media and uh, we would be we would uh, write news releases, and in those days, they were all everything was done by mail. Mm -hmm. There was no electronic distribution right. when, when I first came. But we had started to do it. I had started to do it at Penn State, uh, uh -huh. and I knew it was coming, uh, and I knew I knew it was the, really the wave of the future. So uh, uh, very quickly after I got here, we began to look at acquiring the technology to distribute things electronically. Right. Then in 85, no, the, you became director of university relations. How did that, what were some of the involvement uh, there? When I came to Purdue, uh, president was uh, Arthur Hansen. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, Arthur Hansen announced, I came in in August, and it was a day in October 
when Dr. Hans, I had a call from John Day, I was on campus, they were having trustee meetings that weekend, and uh, he, I was cutting the grass, and uh, John Day called me and he said, you need to come to campus right away. And I remember my wife said, oh my God, what have you done? <laughs> and uh, the reason he wanted me to come was because uh, Dr. Hansen had announced to the trustees, uh, quite, and it was quite a surprise, that he had decided that uh, he would retire at the end of the fiscal year, and uh, he just we decided he wanted to step down as president. Uh, he did not have another position at that time. Later, he became the uh, uh, the head of the Texas A&M system, uh, but at that point, he just uh, decided that he was going to retire. Uh, so I had to handle the, that announcement, and uh, and then uh, he, so he left in July. Uh, and uh, John Hicks became uh, interim president of the university in July and, and was in that position for one year prior to uh, Dr. Steve Beering coming here. Uh, when, when Dr. Beering arrived, uh, he told me almost uh, from almost uh, in the first week he was here, I think, he said that his preference was that the public relations operation report directly to him. And uh, he said, so he, he made it known that that was his intention. Uh, and, but he also wanted to review the whole area. So he hired a consulting firm, and they came in, and they looked at uh, what we had. They talked to me and asked for my recommendations and so forth. And uh, they recommended that we create a, uh, a department or a, an office that included public information, which is a news operation, uh, publications, which also had reported to John Day, who was the director of or vice president for development. And I recommended that we establish uh, something called uh, the Office of Community Relations to help deal with uh, uh, visitors coming to mm -hmm. campus and uh, just general uh, community issues that we didn't have any there were a lot of things that went on between the university and the community. Uh, when people came here for visits and things like that, uh, usually they would be accommodated somehow, but there was no central operation that w whose job it was. And I found that I often got those requests, and it seemed to me... They didn't know who to call uh, coming on campus. Yeah, so I, I felt like we needed to have uh, an operation that would... Uh, uh, it would be their responsibility to deal with visitors and deal with community issues. And so we hired, uh, my, the first person in the position was uh, Annette Gobin. I hired mm -hmm. Annette uh, after we established it. And uh, she was a, she grew up in Lafayette, so she really knew her way around. And uh, she held that job for many years. And then uh, later, uh, uh, Mike Pickett, who had been the uh, general manager of Channel 18, uh, it went into the position, and both of them people were people who had really good connections. And we uh, we established uh, uh, a, a process for dealing with visitors that uses, and I am still very proud of this. Uh, I, when I hired Annette, I said, "I want you to have. To, I want people to be able to get a tour of campus anytime they want to. I want them to be done by students, and I want them to be trained. And we can't pay them." <laughs> And uh, we were able to establish a, uh, uh, a group of, uh, of tour guides uh, who uh, really dedicate themselves to uh, serving the university in this way. And they, they will really, they just do a great job of taking people around. And uh, I've seen them observe them going through. They do a good job. Uh, they, they really do. They don't give student tour. They don't give tours to prospective students. That's a different, that's a right. different function. But, uh, if a new employee, prospective employee is uh, visiting, if a, a company wants to take a tour of campus, any of those kind of things, uh, they will do that. And they, they just, I'm very proud of the job they do. They do a good job. Let me ask you a question. Was that facility there when the community relations was open? I'm, t I'm thinking for researchers now, they, if they come on campus, they see that facility. Was that there at the time? Uh, the actually, uh, or not? Uh, it was not. Um, I'm trying to remember now. They, they were they were roughly concurrent. Uh, we were in the process of building that garage, that Northwestern parking garage, right. and I, I would give uh, I give uh, 
uh, Ken Burns credit. Uh, Ken was uh, vice president for facilities at the time. Sure. And Ken believed in what we were trying to get done there uh, with with a, with a visitor center, and he said, "This is going to be the garage where we're going to direct our visitors to, and so this is a good home for it." And so it's he, a great location. He he made a, he made that space available for them, uh, and it has a nice conference room. It's a little smaller than I all a little bit smaller than I would like it to be. Uh, but it's really been a great location, and there's room for the students to uh, you know, have room to study and things sure, like that. Right. So that's really worked out very well. Very nice. And then you made now, and then University News Service used to uh, oversee that too. Well, at the uh, when you when, took when, over, uh, when with, with Dr. Beering, what we did, what he said was, you know, we're going to reorganize. So the, the reorganization was uh, uh, publications, news service, community relations all reporting to the director of public information, which was me. Okay. And uh, we, uh, uh, we also created a director of special projects, which initially was, at that time was, uh, was Chuck Leslie, who had been a member of the news uh, public information staff when I came. Uh, and uh, uh, the special project is a person who kind of handles whatever needs to get handled at a given moment. Uh, work functions, you know, clo works very closely with me. Uh, and Chuck did that until he retired. And then uh, Greg Zawisha, who had been at WBAA and then worked in the news service, uh, got the job. And, and it's currently uh, Jim Brujink, who is uh, who previously was uh, uh, sports information director. Mm -hmm. So, okay. uh, and that's pretty much the structure we have now, except. Well, broadcast services became a separate unit, and uh, we also created a, uh, a director, of an office of uh, university periodicals. And periodicals, per, news service does the news media, publications does the uh, you know, sort of uh, university printed materials, and now does uh, uh, all of the main web pages and uh, and does broader marketing functions and uh, periodicals does our, our sort of in-house publications so which which include inside Purdue perspective uh, uh, retirees newsletter and now Purdue today which we started public we started we created as an right. email newsletter for faculty and staff uh, in 2007. And they also do another email newsletter that goes to uh, alumni. Mm -hmm. We're reaching about 100,000 alumni with that now as well. So everything has gone more electronic. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, uh, yes. Right. And uh, we, we just, uh, just this past, this week, I received the results of a survey we did of the readership of uh, the internal things, inter inside Purdue and Purdue Today. And uh, we're finding that really Purdue today has become the main source of information for faculty and staff on the West Lafayette campus. Uh, so we, we feel like we've had a, a nice success there. Now everybody who comes to work to, to work is yes. greeted with a copy of Purdue today every morning. It's very good. And so I think it really helps bring the community together. Uh, if you're not well informed, it's because you're not paying attention. Right, yeah. Uh, talking about communication service, there's a couple of others like the agricultural and the athletics. Are those, for, yeah. I'm thinking of, when I ask somebody, sometimes I think of researchers, they hear that name and they wonder, yeah. does it fall within your bailiwick? Uh, neither a, neither the agricultural communication service or a, nor athletics reports to me, uh, but in the case of ag communications, they do sort of a specialized news publications and or new uh, uh, they do media relations with uh, the ag related community and they do some publications for uh, that are specialized for ag and for extension uh, any news releases they do uh, come through the university news service for editing so we were able to and not a lot of schools that have an ag school operate this way. Historically, uh, ag colleges of agriculture uh, were ahead of universities in knowing how to communicate. Uh, there, in most cases, 
there was an ag communications area before there was a university communications mm -hmm. area, and I think that's true at Purdue as well. Uh, but we are a, we do work very closely with uh, with the uh, with the ag communications staff. So whatever they write, it's going to go to go to the news media, comes to the news service. Uh, they get to see it if it's ne if it's necessary for me to see it, then. Uh, it'll it'll come to me. These will be cases where there's uh, research being reported and things like sure. that. Okay. Uh, so we were able to have a, a level of consistency and quality control that most schools don't have. Working but, as a liaison. Kind yeah, of but thing. the director of uh, ag communications reports to the dean of agriculture. Okay. Okay. Uh, sports, uh, uh, athletic public relations, I believe it's called now. Uh, this is Tom Schott's area. Uh, they report to the athletic director on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they function pretty much uh, without any input or uh, involvement by my by me or my staff. Uh, but when there's a when there's a situation that uh, may affect the university's reputation, uh, then we get involved. Sure, understand. Uh, uh, Serious coaching changes. Uh, if, if an athlete is uh, got, might is, be NCAA something of that sort, maybe. Uh, yeah, when those kind of things happen, right. if an athlete is uh, you know has, has gotten into trouble of some kind, or a staff member has gotten into trouble of some kind, uh, then uh, and the athletic director and I are on the phone. Uh, he's very good about letting me know uh, when an issue is coming. Uh, recent example. Uh, the uh, celery bog uh, uh, case where they, uh, it, some trees were, were removed. Right. Uh, we could have done a little better job of communicating on the front end of that, but because it occurred and uh, uh, it was starting to reflect, it was starting to have an impact on the university's reputation locally, uh, I was talking to the people in athletics and essentially yes. trying to advise them on what they could do and right. steps they could take and, and so forth. Away. That's right. So. Do you have any liaison all with the alumni office as far as the... Uh, the alumni concerned? association uh, is, a, is an independent entity. Uh, they report to their own board, so they, they are not responsible technically to anybody at Purdue. Uh, but uh, the executive director of the alumni association uh, serves uh, has a dotted line to the senior vice president for advancement and so we go to the same meetings uh, the uh, alumni magazine editor uh, consults with us on a regular basis about what her you know uh, she'll if she has a uh, an article she'll first of all she sends me a list of what she's going to do and she if she has an article that she thinks might be Problematic in some way, she might send it to me and say, "How do you feel about this? Sure. You know, is is this going to create any problems for the university?" So, the alumni association exists to, to a large extent for the benefit of the university, uh, and so they 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 work very closely with us. Yeah, that's a good relationship. It, 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 it's yeah. it's worked very well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. What um, what has been? Would you say your immediate with the press, your contact with the press? Is that on a daily basis outside or? <sighs> Uh, There's well, a lot of challenges with that. Yeah, uh, one of the part of the job, is, my, my job over the years, has been to be the university spokesperson, and I've done that, and that's got, certainly creates some of the more exciting moments. Uh, I've tried to turn that over, that role over to the director of the news service uh, more and more. And that's Gene Norberg, and okay. Gene actually has the title now of university spokesperson. Uh, I will still get involved in some instances. But uh, the, in a, it's a role that wasn't in the job description when I came here. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, be, it very soon became clear that you needed that uh, right. you needed to have that function within the university. And when you're uh, universities are not the sort of uh, tranquil places that the uh, uh, exist in the polite fiction. Uh, th this is a city that has uh, uh, on campus every day there certainly are at least 50,000 people, uh, many often a lot more than that, uh, and things happen. Uh, people die, people get sick, people commit suicide, there are accidents, we have crime, we've had, uh, in fact, uh, I'm, I'm giving a talk this afternoon of, on crisis communication and I 
I pulled up, we maintain in our files a, a list of, uh, for instance, when, a, uh, when, when you have a st student death under unusual circumstances, uh, which un for tragically does happen, uh, one of the questions will always come up, well, you know, when's the last time this happened, this kind of thing happened? Well, we have a list, and the, the, the current list that I have goes back to 1989, and it had 13 instances on it of cases of uh, violent or unusual death. Uh, and in some cases, there was more more than one person uh, victimized. Uh, there was a plane crash uh, on campus with uh, three people killed. We had a uh, uh, we've had uh, a double murder. We've had a murder suicide. So those things, uh, uh, so you know, they occur in, in about a 19, 18 or nineteen year period. Uh, you know, we we end up with probably about that number of students who have uh, or or direct people are directly in, involving our people that have uh, that have died on campus uh, so these things happen you have uh, uh, recruiting situations in athletics uh, you can have uh, instances of uh, uh, individual uh, malfeasance we've had uh, uh, cases of uh, embezzling that became quite heavily uh, you know quite notorious so in every one of those situations the university has got to respond, and one of the first rules uh, of responding in, in what you'd call a crisis is is to have is to have your story straight and only have one story. And the only way you can only have one story is to only have one person. So, the way that I I, I like to operate uh, when we have a situation where uh, it, it, we're going to be we're going to be asked questions in an intense atmosphere. If we have somebody who is truly ex who, who truly has expertise and is capable and willing to deal with the news media, I would rather let that person do it. Uh, but it's rare when you have somebody who is all three, <laughs> who has the knowledge, has the capability, and has the, the uh, has the willingness, and. Uh, because once you're on the spot, you got to stay there until the, until the situation is resolved. So in most cases, uh, if uh, people will say, "I would rather you do it, Joe," or "I would rather have Jean do it if, if she's in that role," and but if if uh, two people could say have every intention of saying exactly the same thing, but if you can if you contradict each other even the least bit. Uh, that opens up a whole different situation as far as media coverage is concerned, and now you have to explain those differences. So we really try on. to we really try very hard to have the university have one spokesperson for the university. You can't control, and you don't want to control everybody in the institutions. Uh, the faculty members and students can speak. You know they're free to do that, but when it comes to speaking for the institution, we try to do it with one person. So. Right. Uh, and those are very interesting times when you have to uh, when you have to deal with this. When maybe something is that's uh, pretty awful has happened to somebody, uh, you, you have to you have to deal with that. You may have personal feelings uh, about what has happened, but you're not expressing your personal views, you've got to speak for, on behalf of the university. On behalf of the university, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So be in, right. It, what about relations with the regional campuses? Do you have get in touch, or do you have a, a counterpart there? Uh, I have, uh, we have, yeah, there are okay. counterparts to my organization on every campus. These report to their chancellors. Okay. Uh, and it's very, it's very much like the relationship we have with athletics here. Uh, for the most part, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, they do their they do their uh, thing, uh, put out their information and so forth. Sure. Uh, but uh, uh, when there's a uh, when there's a problem, when they feel like the institution the reputation is involved, or they just need a sounding sure. board, sure. Uh, I'll get a phone call or an email, and we'll you know from somebody at Calumet or Fort Wayne, and they'll say, "How do you think we should handle this?" or Here's what we plan to do. How do you feel about that? And, uh, Use the resources, and this is good, and you're a good yeah. source for that. Yeah, that, that's really what it is. You right. become, you become and your relationship resource. with the Office of the President, do you report, you report to the uh, President? Uh, I reported to Beering uh, when Martin Jiske came. 
uh, Martin Martin liked the model of having a an advancement organization, and so he created the Senior Vice President for Advancement, and uh, I reported to uh, Murray. so I so I report to Murray uh, administratively. I always have had uh, ac direct access to the president, though, and that was part of my conversation with Dr. Jiski was uh, your access won't suffer, uh, but administratively he wanted to do it this way. Uh, he, uh, Martin wanted to uh, have fewer direct reports than he had when he came, and it's, but that worked very well. We have, we've had no sure. problem with that. Murray has been very supportive. He's never tried to, uh, he's never tried to uh, uh, inhibit my ability to work with the president when I needed to. And uh, so it's it's been a good arrangement either way. It's worked out very well. Yeah. Yeah. But the, right. the model mo the model that most people in my area uh, like is for the, is to report to the president. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I cannot say that uh, the change that change had any negative effect on sure. us at all. And you you're still doing some teaching then in the department as an adjunct. Are you going to continue on with that? Do you think? Yeah, I, I taught uh, when I f when I first came, not not immediately, but maybe I'd been after I'd been here three or four years. Uh, I taught a news writing class in the Department of Communication. And I did it for a couple of years. I enjoyed it, but it was it, it was really, really hard to do it, do it well and still do my job. And then uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they talked to me about it again. And uh, so last fall, I agreed to teach a section of public relations writing. Uh, and uh, I taught it, uh, so I, I taught it, in, I've taught it the last two falls, and I'm going to teach it again this coming fall, this coming fall Good. Okay. after I retire from my main position. And it's still more work than I can do, uh, but... Uh, but it's a nice... It's a nice well, I've, I've learned to work a little bit smarter in my, in my full-time <laughs> job, and the teaching is uh, really uh, is something I really enjoy a lot. And you get, get in touch with the students and you keep in touch, which is nice. Yeah, you know, and you know, and, and it keeps you on your toes. You have to think about, you have to think about uh, uh, the uh, things that you're right. And uh, I, I teach public relations writing in a way I, my, my, my guiding principle is that writing is your core skill in this, no matter what your responsibilities are, and that uh, uh, in in this field you have to be you have to be the most versatile of writers because you have to write news you have to write for brochures you have to write scripts you have to write speeches uh, you have to write uh, statements you have to write letters uh, the whole gamut th yeah there isn't any type of writing that I don't do myself as sure. uh, even though uh, my writing is not my job really uh, but it's inevitable that uh, that I'm going to get involved in it, and so try to teach them if they can if they can learn how to be uh, uh, reasonably adept in all these different things that they'll always be able to they'll be able to be able to function. Right. So. Yeah. Um, they and your book that Boiler Maker Music Makers. How did you decide to write that? Oh, that's uh, let's Comment. see. <laughs> that's a nice book. That it's was a long time ago. Uh, Actually, what happened was uh, that's very nice. And I was not too long after I I don't remember how long it had been. I hadn't been here more than a couple of years, I guess, at Purdue. Uh, they had talked. We had a we had a writer on the staff at uh, uh, in public information named Ken Kaiser, and Ken. Uh, I remember Ken. Uh, was a very nice man. Uh, eventually retired and moved back to the state of Washington, I believe. Uh, but they had talked to him about writing it, and he decided, uh, for some reason, that he did not think he should do it or didn't think he could do it. And so he came to me and he said, they'd like you to help him find somebody to write the book. And I didn't know that much about, I mean, I knew there was a glee club, and that was about all I knew. Uh, and, uh, and so I looked at it, and I met with uh, the, the director and the, and the uh, president of the PMO club, it's just kind of their alumni group, uh, and the more I thought about it, I thought it might be kind of fun to do this. And I met with Al Stewart before that as well. I forgot Al, Al was retired as uh, PMO director, and uh, so finally I said, "Well, I, I, I'm willing to take a shot at it." So we we made a you know we developed Good. a little contract, and 
I spent uh, many nights in Al Stewart's kitchen with him spinning tales. Sure. And I had to, uh, and I talked to, a lot, of course, a lot of people who had been members of uh, the Glee Club and other parts of uh, PMO and the staff and so forth and students. And uh, really, over the years, I've had a very nice relationship with PMO. I uh, became one of their, uh, what they call their sires, who are the uh, kind of the faculty fellows that, that sure. uh, uh, Which is very nice. Spent time, and that, that's been very gratifying. And uh, so I, uh, uh, you know, and, and I, I sort of had to figure out how to tell that story because it was, uh, and I decided it was, it, it, even though it, it was it was PMO, uh, it was really Al Stewart's story. So it had to be written almost as a biography. Mm -hmm. So, right. and that was the approach I took, and it was a lot of fun to do it. Uh, it would be kind of fun to go back and update that, I yes, suppose. Yes, that would now. be it's nice. Been a, it's exactly. been a long time. Exactly, right, yeah. And a couple things. That speak, uh, the Speaker's Bureau, is that still going? We have a Speaker's yeah. Bureau. That's, you don't uh, hear so much about that. I remember earlier years when I came, there was more. They used yeah. to have a brochure they used to send out. Yeah, it's, it's actually, the Speaker's uh, Bureau is, uh, is really, it's run out of the news service now. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's actually more active now, I think, than it's oh, ever it? been. Uh, they, they, I don't know. I don't have the statistics in my head, but uh, they really place a lot of speakers around the state. But so much of it now is done by email and right, uh, and, and the right. internet. Uh, but we have a we have a good long list of speakers. Uh, they're they're out there. Uh, uh, so it must know. have been revived because I think for a while there was kind of a, it, a, it, a dead it, sort of was there, it, but not. I think there. It, it had sort of petered out. Yeah, right. Uh, and I think at one point. At one point, it was operated out of a different part of the university. That's right. And, uh, I remember when it first got started when uh, I was here. We have a lady, uh, Gretchen Bertolet is the one who runs it, and uh, she's uh, she's the spouse of the head of the Department of Philosophy. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, she just does a really good job with sure. it. So we've placed, uh, through her efforts, we've really, we've really uh, yeah. Put a lot of Purdue speakers out there, so they are. It is getting done. All right. A couple of things. They, uh, they still they're still doing a Purdue a, cl a closer look. Uh, does that operate out of your office? Uh, a, a closer look. That TV thing. Uh, uh, who puts that together or not? Uh, or is that? That's. Uh, uh, yeah, that's. Okay. That's done. And then you, they, and of course they do the newsreels every year too, which is nice. We we do the newsreel for the alumni association every right. association every year. Uh, the other thing that's uh, evolved, in there, I should say, uh, exploded, <laughs> uh, with the uh, establishment of the Big Ten Network. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, each each university in the Big Ten uh, has the opportunity to produce uh, program non sports programming that'll run on the Big Ten Network, and that's started from the beginning. And we we actually we actually uh, are are entitled to produce in the air up to sixty hours a year uh, of non sports programming that would be on, would be shown on the Big Ten. No university has the capacity to produce anywhere near that amount of uh, programming. Uh, most schools are doing uh, have or probably have done at this point. Uh, Somewhere between, uh, somewhere between five hours and uh, actually less than that. I know there's at least one school that's only done one hour. <laughs> uh, they really have done somewhere between zero and about <laughs> 25 hours. Uh, we've done about, uh, I think we've done about seven or eight now. Good. And we're sort of uh, in the middle, upper middle of the pack as far as the amount of production we've done. Sure. I think the quality of what we've done has been fine, but we've actually used. Uh, we, we've taken what we what we what we put together for the Purdue newsreel, and we've repackaged that in a way that uh, to, into a program called Purdue Pride. And so there's a sort of a here's what's been going on at Purdue for the last six months kind Very of good. Uh, program that airs on the Big Ten Network. And I've got a new one that we're ready to submit right now. Uh, we've done a wonderful program on uh, John Wooden. Uh, that uh, was produced. Uh, that was produ that was produced by uh, the the, uh, the TV producers in ITAP. Uh, Steve Hall in uh, Hall of Music 
produced a very nice piece on the university bands. Uh, those are some of the examples of things. But but this is w what we've done is we've tried to pull together different resources from within the university, and we also worked outside with a company called the Sanders Group, and uh, they've helped us produce some of these as well. Uh, and it's really what it is, is a consortium of uh, different units within the university uh, that have the capacity to produce uh, television. So right. uh, that's a new responsibility. And actually another one that uh, came about with uh, when Dr. Jiski became president, uh, uh, Dr. Beering, uh, although he did, he did a large amount of public speaking, uh, he really preferred to, uh, in most cases, to uh, speak pretty much extemporaneously. Uh, we did write some speeches for him. Uh, I wrote all of his commencement speeches myself. Uh, but when uh, Dr. Jiski came, his, his style of public speaking was to have a prepared text for every speech that he gave. And he gives about 400 speeches a year. He gave at least 400 speeches a year, some years more. Uh, and so when I saw what he what he needed, I said, I've got to have, <laughs> I, I wrote as many as I could, uh, you know, the first few, uh, the first few months he was here. Uh, but I said, I, this is a full-time job and I've got to have a speechwriter. So he, he was very gracious. He said, all right, you know, we, 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 and so we hired John Norberg and John has done a marvelous job for the university. Yes. Uh, he, uh, and, and John, we've since added a second speechwriter. Uh, that helps us, uh, that's taken on some of that load. And John is uh, doing some other, doing some other assignments in addition to doing his speech writing now. So, uh, uh, but that has be become a very important function now. And uh, we're continuing to support Dr. Corden, right. of course. Right, so. and then big thing coming up, the inaugural, and that's the first one we've ever had. First, first inaugural in my experience. Uh, right. Uh, a lot of activity. There's uh, several symposia that are going to be be held, and the uh, program looks good. Global, I've seen the news releases. Yeah, global convocation is going to be is going to be done. Uh, just a lot of different things, and uh, uh, we're a lot of my people now are involved with uh, uh, producing the printed materials and the electronic things that go with that. Right. So, and your new web page, which is uh, you want to make a comment on that? How yeah, that for uh, research is how it came about. We we. Uh, uh, Despite Purdue's uh, uh, prominence in the uh, you know, in the uh, technical areas, uh, I, I think we've been, we were, we've been a little bit uh, behind in kind of mobilizing all of our resources, and that was part of what the creation of uh, creation of ITAP, uh, Information Technology at Purdue, which is not part of my operation, uh, has gone a long way toward uh, getting all our resources sort of pointed in one direction. Uh, development of, uh, of the One Purdue uh, initiative to uh, get our uh, our enterprise program together has been important as well. But uh, the the Office of Marketing Communication, which is the uh, which is what the Office of Publications evolved into, sure. uh, took on the responsibility of uh, of the web university's homepage. And the what we call the upper tier pages, the pages that serve the colleges and the, right. the provost office, the admissions office, and so forth. And uh, web uh, uh, web creation is a it's a it's a design function, but it's also a uh, uh, sort of an organizational challenge in the way you organize material and make it accessible. And uh, one of the qualities of uh, uh, of the inter of the internet is everybody everybody wants to be on the home page and they all want to be prominent <laughs> and uh, so you, you you we really I think ended up with a with a home page that was uh, too busy and too complicated and we knew that uh, but uh, uh, we really didn't have the full technical resources we needed or the manpower resources to make the changes that we needed to make as fast as we wanted to make them. And we've really been working for about two and a half years on pulling this thing together. And uh, Dave Brandon, the director, and uh, Melanie Hahn and his staff and many others 
uh, have worked really hard on this, and we launched it on uh, March 28th, 29th, March 29th, it was mm -hmm. Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, but prior to the launch, uh, there was a lot of, uh, not just a lot of design, but a lot of uh, focus groups of trying out different ideas, uh, testing it, using it. We put it up as a beta site, which means that people could look at it uh, if they knew where it was and offer suggestions. And we're actually, even though we've launched the page and it is functioning now, uh, we still we're still treating it as a beta site. The old site is still there. The new site is fully functioning, and we're allowing letting people tell us mm -hmm. what do you th what do you think it's sure. going to be like. And I really think uh, the, the reaction good. has just been extremely positive. Right. We've had suggestions. Good. Uh, that I think that always makes you feel better. That's not there. Are, you know, something you have to do some tweaking and things. Yeah. And, and, and you know we're 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 receptive. And you know the people are looking at it. And, yep. and when they when yeah. they come back at it, which is a, you yeah. know the good. Feedback, I think, is yeah. nice. So and that's yeah. uh, uh -huh. okay. Um, what are your retirement plans? Well, uh, I retire officially on June 30. Okay. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I have a, I have a granddaughter and another grandchild on the way. They live in, uh, they live in Pittsburgh, so I hope to spend a little bit of time, uh, a little sure. more time, uh, uh, seeing that generation of the family. Uh, and I have two daughters. My other daughter lives in, uh, currently lives in Tampa. We'll be moving to Atlanta soon, and so uh, some chance to do, to uh, spend a little more time there. I will teach in the fall. Uh, I'd like to be able to do some. Uh, I'd like to be able to do some writing. Okay. Uh, if I have an opportunity to uh, help with anything at Purdue, you know, on a part-time basis, uh, I'd welcome that as well. And maybe there'll be some consulting in the future. Sounds like that, good. Too. One final thing. Got an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to share with us? One an, comes to mind. An outstanding event in my life. I, well, I, I guess for me, the uh, you know, my, my, I think I would say my, my marriage and the birth of my two children, I have to give those things Sounds kind of good. equal standing. Uh, I, I think in my career, uh, I think uh, being able to, uh, uh, to, Take all of the various uh, communication and PR functions and put them to, putting them together uh, to getting it something like a, uh, a well-oiled machine. I guess uh, it doesn't ever really function that cleanly, but uh, uh, having everything uh, moving in the same direction uh, that to me that was a, a really a big step yeah. for. for thank that, you so. very much. This concludes. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Joe Ben, I appreciate that. Thank you. This concludes the interview. Okay. All right.